Hey, welcome again to Catalyst Online. Thank you so much for joining us. And to those of you that are maybe new to this online experience, extra special welcome to you. We are really thankful that you're joining us for this. Um, and we'd love to know that you are joining us this morning as you watch online. Uh, the best way you can let us know that is to text Catalyst SP to 97000. And that, that will get a link sent back to you that you can fill out our digital um, online connect card. You can share your information with us, share any next steps you'd like to take, share any ways you, we can be praying for you. But we'd love to celebrate that you were joining us this morning for the first time. So let us know about that by texting Catalyst SP to 97000. And for the rest of you that consider uh, Catalyst your church family, also make sure that you take advantage of that so you can send in your prayer requests. We go through those every week in our staff meeting. We pray for all those prayer requests that come in. If you want to meet with any of us on the pastoral staff, if you want to take a next step on getting involved, if you want to take a next step of baptism, all those resources are available to you on that digital cars so let us know how we can uh, how we can serve you best a few things i want to let you know about that uh, we're getting pretty excited about here we have on november 8th which is next sunday we are kicking off our three venues that we have we're going to be moving to our indoor service at 10 a.m we'll be hosting our outdoor venue in the parking lot with a stream that is showing exactly what is going on inside outside on some tv screens and we're also going to continue our online platform if you are most comfortable doing that but that is coming one week from today and uh, super excited about that. Uh, Services on campus will be 10 a.m. Online service will continue to be at 9 a.m. And uh, information is going to be sent out to you guys about how you can make your reservations for being here in person. But we're super excited that uh, we've moved to this next level of being able to uh, gather as a church family. And just think about this. It's going to take a lot of extra help to make this happen again, okay? We haven't, we haven't been indoors for a long time, so we need you to uh, think about joining a team. Maybe you were on a, ser- a team serving here at church uh, before all this craziness hit, or maybe you're kind of new to Catalyst and you'd like to get involved. What I need you to do is I need you to go to the Church Center app and click on the link that talks about the four different uh, teams that you can join. There's pit crew, there's prayer team, there's online hosts, um, and there's a greeting team. And we really need um, some uh, people who are really excited about serving the Lord to join one of those teams so that we can make gathering on Sunday mornings in person in the parking lot and in our building just the best possible experience we can. So would you please consider um, joining one of the teams so that we can get things launched with excellence on November 8th. And then lastly, if you are kind of new to Catalyst, whether it's been online or in person, we want to invite you to a Monday night Zoom meeting on Monday, uh, November 9th to what we call Discover Catalyst. And that's a Zoom meeting where Pastor Chris and I will hang out with you for about an hour and just fill you in on what Catalyst is all about, why we exist 
exist, why we do what we do, what our purpose, what our mission is, and also give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself um, and also find out some potential next steps you can um, take here at Catalyst. So the way you can register for that is on the Catalyst uh, Church Center app. You can click on the registration specifically for Discover Catalyst, which will be coming up on Monday night, December 9th on Zoom. The three most important and significant days of my life are number one, the day that I got saved. The day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ was the defining moment of my life. It changed me forever. Second most important day of my life was the day I got married. It's the day that I'd made the commitment to my wife, Sierra, that we would spend the rest of our lives together and we would start a family together. We'd start ministry together and everything. Third most important day of my life was the day my kids were born. Well, actually that's like, two days because we have two kids, but you know what I'm talking about. Those are the significant days of my life. Now, you probably would say that you have your top three most significant days of your life. The, most, the three most important days in human history are number one, the birth of Jesus Christ. For if God would not have come in the flesh, we would never have known the heart of our Heavenly Father. I think the second most important day in all of human history is the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That signified the day that the Messiah gave his life for the world and proved to the world that sin and Satan and death have no power over the power of God and that the saving power of Jesus Christ can win over everything. For no two events in human history have changed the face and the direction of this planet, his birth and his resurrection. Now, I would argue, for the sake of today, that the third most important day in all of human history is the day of Pentecost. Now, for some of you that are church-going people, you might say, well, yeah, I know know exactly what the day of Pentecost is. I've, I've read my Bible, and I know what that is, and I know the significance of that day. And so when I say day of Pentecost, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's probably some of you that are, that was also call yourself church-going people. You're like, hmm, I've heard that word before, but I, I don't really know what, Pentecost is, and I don't know what its significance is, and that's really cool. Now, there may be some of you watching where you say, I didn't, I've never even heard of that day before. And so, Chris, you must be out of your mind when you say that this day that I've never even heard of is the most significant day, or the third most significant day in all of human history. So as we begin as a church through now our reading plan through the book of Acts this week, we come across this event in Acts chapter 2, this event that I'm arguing was the beginning or the, the, the third most significant day in all of human history. And I want to read it to you. Now, you may have never read this before or you may have, but I want to read the story to you so that you have a proper understanding of what the day of Pentecost, what happened on the day of Pentecost. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost came, they, meaning the disciples, were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, these, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts from Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Now, to understand what's going on here at the day of Pentecost, we have to go back in time a little bit, maybe just a a few days before that, right after the resurrection, as, as Luke starts to write his book of Acts, he tells of this story of Jesus speaking to his disciples. He's, Jesus says here, in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while he, meaning Jesus, was eating with them, meaning the disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, 
but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Skip down to verse 8. Or exactly, let's stay at verse 6. When they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to, uh, to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And Acts 1.8 becomes the mission statement of the book of Acts and the mission statement for the church. He says in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, to understand what Jesus said in Acts 1, we have to go back even further about about 40 days prior to that when Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the upper room, but the, the night before he was going to be arrested. And he said this over the Passover meal with his disciples. Here's some isolated verses that give us context. Chapter 14, verse 25 and 26. Jesus says this to the disciples, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus promises them that there will be an Advocate, or as he described it, the Holy Spirit that would come to these disciples and it would do some things with them and for them. Look, skip down to chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. Jesus says to the disciples, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify for you have been with me from the beginning. Skip to verse 7. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. <clears throat> but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Skip down to verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth. So all of those those verses that I just read to you, kind of reverse timeline, give us context for what happens at the day of Pentecost. Now the day of Pentecost, where it gets its name, is from the word pent, or five. Pentecost was the day... Uh, that happened about 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus, uh, his final week of his life was during the Jewish Passover in Jerusalem. And the Passover was a long festival and a celebration of time of worship, remembering the time that God delivered Israel out of slavery. And it says that after Jesus died near the end of Passover, that it was about, he was with his disciples in resurrection for about 40 days. And then we find ourselves what's known as the seventh Sunday after Passover in the, in the festival or the Feast of Weeks, which was the next major feast or festival in the city of Jerusalem in which everyone came together to commemorate the giving of the Torah. It is during the Feast of Weeks in which the Holy Spirit comes, which is why there are so many different people from all over the world, all the Jews from all over the world are there on that particular day. Now something earth-shattering happened and historically significant happened on this day. Jesus told the disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will become my witnesses and the gospel will spread to the very ends of the earth. The book of Acts, as we are going to start reading together as a church, is all about the power of the Holy Spirit taking the gospel through the apostles and through you and me to the very ends of the earth. Now, the Holy Spirit can be a pretty confusing thing because we don't often talk about it as often as we might talk about God the Father or the Son, Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit is introduced essentially into human history in a new way on this day of Pentecost. And there was a lot of confusion, and there still is some confusion about the role of the Holy Spirit in the, in the role of the Christian and in the church. But two things that the early disciples learned 
And the early church learned about the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to understand today. Number one is that they came to a pretty quick realization that this Holy Spirit was God. It was essentially where we get the end of what we would call our Trinitarian theology. It's that God is one, but he is also three. God is one Godhead, but he is in three different persons. The God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit gave them the full understanding of who God is. Now, the Old Testament spoke of the Holy Spirit, but they had never experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. So they learned that the Holy Spirit was God. The second thing that the early church realized very quickly is that the apostles and those that received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts received the fullness of God, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It became God in them. The Spirit of God lived in the early Christians and he also lives in you, Christian. That the fullness of God resides in every single one of us. We as believers, become the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God fully resides. Now, there are different opinions as to what that all means, and they're all within Orthodox Christianity. But nevertheless, the early believers and the early church, and Scripture backs this, is that when we receive Jesus Christ, we receive the fullness of the Spirit in us. It's the presence of God in us. So what I want to do for the rest of our time is I want to talk about what does it mean to, for us to possess the power of the Holy Spirit. And what do we receive with that power? The first one that Scripture talks about a lot when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit, number one, is that the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to receive salvation. The power to receive the salvation that God offers to us through Jesus Christ. Now, one of the common threads that I hear when I talk to people about when they gave their life to Jesus Christ is that they realize that long before they made that decision to follow Jesus, that God was working on them and God was working around them. That the Holy Spirit was, was giving them ideas and thoughts and saying, you know, uh, read this or explore this or begin praying in this way. They also realize that the Holy Spirit was bringing people into their life to to help them understand what was going on and the ways that God was trying to get their attention or was trying to speak to them. So we see that God was, that the Holy Spirit already begins to work on people before they receive Christ as their Lord and Savior through circumstances or dreams or what they read or the relationships that are brought in. And everyone I talk to that has given their life to Christ says, at some point, I realized that the Holy Spirit was at work around me. And God was trying to get my attention, to to bring me to the point of salvation. And that was the work of the Holy Spirit. See, I believe, and I think the Bible would back this, is that in our depravity and sinfulness, we, as natural beings, are completely incapable of even thinking of anything in the spiritual or the supernatural without the intervention of the Holy Spirit. That's just the way our earthly minds work. And so the Holy Spirit, as God, works in us. And But for, the, for those that have not given their lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit works on them to push them to it. That's why when Jesus had a conversation with a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he, Jesus talks to him. He says that you not only to, need to be born of water, which is the, the natural birth process, but you also must be born of the Spirit in order to be born again or to receive salvation. And Jesus says that that Spirit is working on those who have not yet received the salvation through the Spirit. And so he says, to, he says to Nicodemus, he goes, this spirit that I'm referring to, you can't see it, but you can feel it. And that's evidence that the Holy Spirit is giving you the power to receive the salvation that Jesus Christ has to offer to every single one of us. So if you're in that place where you're investigating faith, and you're trying to, you say, man, I don't understand what's going on, but for the first time, I'm, I'm thinking about things that have to do with faith. I'm praying for the first time, or maybe you're at a place of desperation, or maybe God is bringing Christians into your life, and they're trying to help you navigate the difficulties that you're walking through, and you're, you're saying, man, something is happening. That, my friend, is the power of the Holy Spirit working on you, pushing you, and and prodding you to say yes to the salvation that Jesus Christ has to offer to you. 
Maybe today is your day of salvation. Maybe today is the day when you say, yes, the Holy Spirit has been working on me. And I'm choosing to say yes to Jesus and to give my life to him. Because it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit that lives in you. Jesus promises us, Scripture promises us, that the Spirit is working on us. When we give our lives to Christ, the Spirit begins to work in us. And so we are able to receive the salvation that God has to offer to us because of the Holy Spirit. Second thing that the Holy Spirit gives us power to do, the Holy Spirit gives us power to walk in God's will. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, will be our guide. He's going to remind us of the teachings of Jesus. He's going to guide us into all things that are truth. <clears throat> God gives you the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can know the plan that God has for you so that you can walk in his will. It's a wonderful gift to know that I'm no longer guiding my own life, but that the Holy Spirit lives within inside me and is walking me in God's will. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 26, which we read earlier, that says that the Holy Spirit is the one that reminds you of the teachings of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that reminds you of the way that we should live to honor God. It's the, 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 the mind of the Holy Spirit in you that is reminding you to pray, to share your faith, to walk obediently, to love Jesus with everything that you have so that you can walk in his will. Now, some of you are saying, well, how do I know when the Holy Spirit's speaking to me? It's a great question. It's a question that I ask all the time. How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit, not just my crazy brain, or, you know, that I, got, I ate something weird the night before, and I'm having these crazy dreams and thoughts? I think this comes down to an issue of familiarity, is that the closer we are in our relationship with God, the more we hear from His Spirit, and the more we are guided into God's will and God's plan for our life, the more we hear from the Holy Spirit the closer we are with him. So I called an old friend uh, a while ago. Was, gosh, it was a long time ago. I remember this very clearly. But I remember calling a friend, and I, and I speak to this friend quite often, but I had not spoken to his children in a long time. And I remember I called, called him up, and this was, you know, back, he had a house phone, which nobody has anymore, but he still did. And, and one of his kids picked up the phone, and I didn't know which kid it was. I didn't, I didn't recognize the child's voice because I hadn't spoken to that child in a long time, and I knew all the children's names. And so I kind of started going through, oh, is this so-and-so, so-and-so? And they're like, oh, no, this is Jake. And I'm like, oh, Jake, it's so good to hear you. I didn't recognize your voice. Can I speak to your dad? So Jake goes and gets his dad, and, and once my friend gets on the phone, I immediately recognized his voice. Why? Because I talked to him all the time. I didn't talk to his son. And so I couldn't recognize his voice. And so the more we talk with the Holy Spirit in prayer, the more easy it is for us to recognize his voice so that we're guided by him. So when was the last time that you just sat down and, and talked with the Holy Spirit in your life? When was the last time that you just listened for his voice? so that it could become more and more familiar with you. And I guarantee you, the more you listen, and the more you're just quiet, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you'll recognize this power. And you'll know when you're getting off track. You'll know when you're walking off of the path that God has before you. So listen. Listen. Listen for His voice. Because Jesus promises that one of the powers of the Holy Spirit that lives within us guides us into the will of God. If you're wondering, you know, what is God's will for my life? The challenge here is, is to listen, to read scripture, to, to pray, and to allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to guide you because that's the promise that Jesus made here and that's the promise that scripture makes to people like you and me. Third thing I want to remind you of that that the power of the Holy Spirit means for us today is that the Holy Spirit gives us the power to boldly share our faith in Jesus Christ with others. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which we read earlier, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And Jesus says that, that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power to be my witnesses 
Now, the, the word in the original Greek text in Acts 1.8 is actually not witnesses, it's martyr. And I don't know why we decide to translate it into witnesses, but the original language is that you will receive power and you will be my martyrs. You will give your life for the sake of the gospel. And it'll be that power and that boldness that you, uh, you give to this world that will eventually allow the world to know the good news of, of Jesus Christ. And for the rest of the book of Acts, you see this boldness on display. Boldness of men like Peter, who denied Jesus before the resurrection, who now boldly declares after the day of Pentecost the gospel. The boldness of, of men like, like Stephen, are the first martyr recorded in church history in, in, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 7, where he gives his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see the boldness of men like the Apostle Paul, who were once terrorists and persecutors of Christians, are converted and the power of the Holy Spirit gives them the boldness to live even in the face of prison and death and persecution so that, they pro so he, that he could proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And I know that you want more than anything else that if you have friends and family who are still far from God, I know that your desire is that they learn <clears throat> to receive the salvation that Jesus has to offer to us. I know that your heart is for them. And when you lean on the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find that the Holy Spirit is going to give you boldness to talk about your faith with your friends and family, to share what he's doing in you verbally what he's doing. He's going to give you that boldness in the same way that when Moses was nervous about going before Pharaoh because he had a speech impediment and he says, I don't have the boldness or nor do I have the, the ability to speak clearly and to have that before Moses. God told him, he said, Moses, don't worry about all that. Don't worry about what's going to come out of your mouth and don't worry about what those words are going to do on the other end. All I ask of you is to open your mouth and I'm going to speak through you. And we see that consistently throughout the book of Acts. We see that consistently throughout evangelism in our modern culture today. That when the church, that when Christians speak about the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is power behind that. And he's going to give you the boldness to speak. And there's going to be power in those words that go out. And you're going to find that people are going to want to come to Jesus because of your boldness. That's why 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power of love and of self-discipline. And so maybe this is something that you need to start tapping into and, and declaring that yeah, I, I, I'm going to be bold in my faith. I'm going to share Christ verbally with people. Or maybe you need the power um, to share Christ through your actions. Maybe there's some hypocrisy in your life or you have an area of your marriage or your parenting or your finances that are inconsistent with the gospel. And so you say, I need Jesus, I need your power so that, I, so that my life can boldly declare how good you are. Some of you are not using your spiritual gifts and so you say, I need to be able to use my spiritual giftedness in the church so that the church can carry out the mission of God. So one, the third power that it proclaims to us is that we have the power to boldly share Christ. And lastly, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live like Jesus. It actually gives us the power to live like Jesus. So many people always say, I can never live like Jesus. The truth is, the same spirit that lived in Jesus Christ, the same spirit that resurrected him from the grave, lives in you, Christian. And so Jesus had the ability to live in complete obedience to his heavenly Father. And so do you. If you want to read more about what it means to live a spirit-filled life, and how we can walk away from the desires of this world and sin and Satan and temptation and begin to embrace all that God has for us as we attempt to live like him, I encourage you to read Galatians 5, 16 through 26. It ends with a section called the fruit of the Spirit. It says if we want to live by the Spirit, we have to walk away from our old life and we have to desire to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit so that, we can re so that we can have and live fruitful lives. He says, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the life of Jesus. 
And so the power of the Holy Spirit is in you to live like Him. Now the world says, work on yourself, change your behavior, and it'll change who you are. Religion says, jump through these hoops, give this money, do these things, obey the church, obey the pastor, do all of these things, and you will change from the outside in. The gospel of Jesus Christ, because it gives us the Holy Spirit, says, receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will help you to live like Jesus from the inside out. And that's real change because that's the change that the Holy Spirit is doing in every single one of us. And so rely on Him to change you from the inside out. Pursue the work of the Holy Spirit in you and you're going to begin to see that you can live like Jesus like never before. The bottom line for today as, we've, as we examine what this Holy Spirit is that was given to us on the day of Pentecost is that we want to live the same spirit-filled lives that the apostles did throughout the book of Acts. And what we learn from this point forward, as you, as you read through the book of Acts in the weeks to come, you're going to find that the spirit-filled life is one that follows when the Holy Spirit leads. Let me say that again. The spirit-filled life is one that follows when the Holy Spirit leads. That's the story of the book of Acts. You're going to see the Holy Spirit tells them to go here. They did this miracle in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit leads the apostles and these early disciples into the mission that God gave them in Acts 1.8, he wants to do the same thing in every single one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's time, guys, to embrace the power that lives within us. It's time to say, yes, I want to be a Spirit-filled person. Christ follower and allow God to change the outcomes in that but from this day forward when he prompts me to pray I'm going to pray when he prompts me to share Christ with a friend or a family member I'm going to step boldly and I'm going to speak boldly when the Holy Spirit prompts us to love the unlovable I'm going to love boldly when he prompts us to serve your spouse in a new and a different way serve with humility when he prompts you to give generously Give it joyfully and freely. When he prompts you to avoid sin, run like crazy. When the Holy Spirit prompts you to walk away from a sinful relationship, do it. When the Holy Spirit prompts you to be disciplined in your walk with God, do it. When your heart breaks for the things that break the heart of God, act on it. He saved you. The Holy Spirit has saved you. The Holy Spirit has given you the power to walk in that direction. The Holy Spirit has given you supernatural gifts and a boldness for His sake. The Holy Spirit has brought you into the family of God where you and I will spend eternity with our Heavenly Father for that is the promise that is given to us. And so the power that was given at the day of Pentecost lives in you, Christian. It lives in you. He's given you the power of salvation. He's given you the power of obedience to his word and his walk with, or in your walk with him. He's given you the ability to boldly declare the gospel before others. And he's given you the ability to grow and become more like him. The Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity of God, lives within you. It was given here the most the third most significant day in all of human history. I say that because this was the day that the world began to know who Jesus Christ is. Because if it were not for the Holy Spirit coming on this day, you and I would not be standing here today. For it is the Spirit of God that changes the hearts and the minds of men and women all over the world. He's done it for you. And now he's calling you and he's calling me to take that gospel to the rest of the world. God bless you guys. Love you all very much. Thanks for giving me the time with you today. We'll see you next week.
Thanks again for joining us uh, here online with Catalyst Church. Pray that uh, what you heard in the message this morning from Chris uh, is just meaningful and that'll give you some things to really ponder and consider and uh, make some really cool next steps in your own life and in your own faith based on what you heard from the book of Acts this morning. So uh, don't forget, coming November 8th, we're going to have the options for meeting indoors in addition to streaming a service on our parking lot. So if you want to stay outdoors and we'll continue to see you online on November 8th at 9 a.m. as well. We love you guys. Have a great week. God bless, and we'll see you soon.